Peter. Let's see. Shannon, I. Sorry, multitasking here. Uh, nope. I guess we are settling on our house tomorrow. So. <gasps> That's exciting. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. In, in Schwanksville? No, where is it? Phoenixville. Phoenixville, right. Cool. Yeah, so yeah, we're packing and doing a bunch of stuff. Why are you moving? <laughs> a mile and uh, 1.3 miles down the road. It doesn't look like it's packed. Oh, you should have seen it earlier. <laughs> it doesn't look packed, that is true. Oh, um, yeah, two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Marianne, I like your um, ornament. Thank you for showing us that. <laughs> Excellent. That's I terrific, Mary. I might need one of those. I'm enjoying the view of the baby there. Any baby time is joyful time. Baby. Whoa, um, that's a baby. That's so cute. Wow, so little. And it's oh. <laughs> oh, he waved or she. Sorry. Oh my God. Okay, I'm gonna stop staring at the baby or I'll just do that for an hour. Um, my moment of joy is that I got to have a snowball fight with my kid last night. That was great. Snowing already? It snowed, it snowed yesterday, yeah. Oh. And it didn't all melt. That's what we were worried about. The old trash being hidden under snow. <laughs> <laughs> Just because we're in Philadelphia doesn't mean we have to talk about trash. <laughs> All right, who else has a moment of joy for us? Well, I saw a snowman. You did? Yes. Excellent. This morning, a big snowman on my front lawn. Oh my goodness, that's exciting. Yes. I see oh. Nick Blankers there too. And seek I imagine artist. <laughs> Absolutely. Where's Nick Linker? I don't see him. Oh, nope. I can't. Oh, there he is. Hi, Nick. Hey, Kitsuge. We've got a lot of resident people here. And is Nick supposed to do the lecture, not me? <laughs> He's done lots of other okay. talks. Um, I'm going to share my screen since nobody, but feel free to continue to um, pipe up. But here's the. Uh, oh, look how pretty. You guys get super sneak peeks of the building site. Um, this is last, this is this morning covered with snow. Wow. And uh, so the basement is done, and this is the first floor kind of coming together. And the one, oh. Oh no, I'm showing you the last night one. That one, that's last night. Okay, hold on. This is this morning. There we go. Okay, that's this morning. Sun shining on the snow. Look how there's beautiful. Our, there's our elevator and there's our stair tower. So we're pretty excited about that. Is that double the size of what you guys already have or? Jen Martin, would you like to answer that question? Kinsuke, we're in about 21,000 usable square feet if you count the basement, and we're building 34, 35. So not quite double, but at least a third bigger. That's nice. Yeah, wow. we're super excited. So. An elevator will be brand new and safe. <laughs> yes. You can you press can the button off. and it comes to where you are. Oh. It's like well, a new concept with elevators. That you don't have to go find. <laughs> exciting. It is very exciting. Mm. All right. I'm, I will say thank you to everyone for joining us on our Lunch and Learn on this snowy Philadelphia day. And maybe you're somewhere else and it isn't too snowy. I'm Jennifer Zwilling. I'm the curator of artistic programs, and we're honored to have Kinsuki Yamada join us today. He is a resident alum and also the guest juror for Small Favors 2021. And I'll introduce him more formally in a moment, but I always 
I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to join us and to thank all of my colleagues for all the support that allows this program and all the other programs that we do at the Clay Studio to happen. We're working really hard to make sure that we continue to cultivate our robust community, even during this time of COVID and shutdown and um, strangeness that we're in. So if you're interested mm -hmm. in helping out, please feel free to go um, and I'll put a link in the chat in a moment, go over and um, either become a member or shop for the holidays or make a donation um, to the Clay Studio so we can keep doing this good programming. There are lots of new things in the shop at the moment, so I would encourage you to go look over there. We're still doing shipping. Um, if you need it for the holidays, we can get it out to you express or I'm doing local deliveries. So you can have a, a wave at you from my from your front door as I drop things um, on the doorstep if you choose to do it that way. Okay, maybe actually one of my colleagues can drop that donate link into the chat, please. I am, um, again, just really excited that Kintsuki agreed to jury with me and to join us today. Kintsuki Yamada was born in Kamakura, Kanagawa, Japan. He received his MFA from the University of Montana in 2009 and earned his BFA from the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Kintsuki has participated in artist residency programs at the Archie Bray Foundation, the Clay Studio here in Philadelphia, yay, Tyler School of Art, and Cheekwood. His sculptures have been exhibited throughout the U.S. Kintsuki has previously been a visiting artist at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville and a visiting assistant professor at Center College in Danville, Kentucky. He is currently teaching at University of Arkansas. Uh, Rock. That's wrong. Um, is that right, Kintsuki? Did I, is the last part there? That's right, isn't it? That's where you are. That's yeah. uh, the Fayetteville, yeah. Fayetteville University of Arkansas, Fayetteville, Linda and Matthew is. Yeah. Yeah. So mine's a little one in the uh, capital, uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. So. Little Rock, right. Mm -hmm. And then I was just thinking, you must be, are you close to Crystal Bridges? Unfortunately, probably like a three and a half hour drive. So I guess it's a close, closer than me. Yeah, that's, a, that's on my list. I'd love to get there sometime. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you were living in Fayetteville, like Linda and Matthew, it would be much closer. It would be like within an hour to get there. But yeah. There's a lot of Philadelphia stuff in that museum. Oh, yeah? Another, that's another lunch and learn topic. How, all, how they got all that stuff there down in Arkansas. Anyway idea i didn't know that hmm. yeah they tried to get the gross clinic that's definitely another lunch in there um <laughs> we um thought we'd start out i just wanted to ask you my what is now becoming my standard question which is when did you first decide to become an artist or was it a was it a decision or is it something like when when was when did art just become really the most important thing in your life yeah, see, I see some of the people I they, they, they probably know about me, so I don't know I should, how much I should go back, but just in case to somebody don't know me, and um, I was speech pathologist before uh, doing the ceramic thing. So speech pathology was my uh, Japanese college degree, and uh, uh, I did an internship at the hospital and uh, got that degree for speech pathology. So in, in a way, my life was you know, ready to go that point. So you know, what do you do is, is being speech pathologist and uh, work at the rehab section of a hospital. And uh, you know, you just probably you just have to buy a house, get married, get a car, get a mortgage and everything, and your life is set. <laughs> you know, I was probably like, uh, kind of age, and, uh, and, uh, and my father actually went to college uh, in a state called uh, Kansas State University, Manhattan, Kansas. He went to a uh, master degree there for something else. And uh, so uh, my option was to, uh, you know what, maybe I'm gonna go to America too. So I just didn't want to settle. I was too young, just settle to speech pathologist yet. So 
uh, I just came to America and you know, I wasn't quite planned to like go for art or anything, but uh, um, probably the uh, only the class that I can sit still was uh, lunchtime in the art class. And uh, I was pretty good at the gym class too when I was a little and uh, but that's it. And I was bad at the math and I can't sit still and you know, just, so, so when I came to States and I took all these English class first, because, you know, I, I came to state with no English pretty much. And, 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 um, and you took all these international uh, students English course first and, and a certain point that you can take actual uh, college course, college level course. So I decided to take ceramics. And because, uh, you know, ceramics, I mean, even teacher give you a one syllabus, it'll take me, you know, 30 minutes to read through it using dish dictionary. So uh, ceramics seems safe, right? You don't chop your finger off or you don't lose your eyeballs or, you know, it's putting just directly just the clay in your hands. So I took the class and uh, uh, teacher was very nice and uh, I kind of stuck with it. And at that point, I wasn't quite thinking about making Korea out of it, but uh, um, I don't, that, that's all, that's all that happened. And, and that's what I did in Evergreen. And uh, my teacher said, why don't you apply graduate school? And uh, at that point, you can't really go back, you know, because I already had a career once as a speech pathologist. And I can't just Oh, it was fun taking an art class and go back to Japan and what I do, right? Like somebody got to pay a bill. I don't think my parents would be happy. You know, like so that point, I just have to do it. I just have to. This this is what I want to do. So. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think it's funny that you say, "Oh, well, I just took a class," and then my teacher said, "Why don't you go to grad school?" I think there was a lot in between there where you were. Obviously, doing really well for them to be promoting that that was the, a good path for you. So, you know, I didn't have an art background, so I always was behind compared to other art students because, you know, I don't have like a basic like drawing. So, like, you know, foundation courses, I was speech pathology, and it just, I was behind all the time. But it's, it's the first time that I was exciting, excited to go to school. So, I just like you wake up in the morning and you just want to go go to studio and and that point studio was open 8 a.m till like a 9 or 10 p.m and studio get locked up but uh and I stayed all the time I went to a different class from there and basically I stayed there and uh, I don't and I don't know why but it just just that was my interest and that's what I like to do so I guess I guess that I didn't really think about future in Korea at that point but it just I was first time I felt that I wanted to go to school. <laughs> and yeah, that's hugely important, and it's really empowering too, especially when you're doing well and getting encouragement, and you're enjoying it. Um, I think it's I see. I didn't know that you had been a speech pathologist before, but you talk so much about communication and your artist statement and in other interviews I've heard. Um, there's definitely some kind of through line there um to sort of basically helping other people see helping other people communicate their their feelings I guess does that feel like it's a an interest that's moved from one career to the next I think it started off with uh, my own saving myself probably because <laughs> you know you speak zero English but uh when, when you start taking art courses, you, you can make a friends by you know, making things and you don't have to speak English and something interesting and then somebody will come to you and talk to you and you be friends. And uh, so definitely that taking art courses helped me to you know make a friends and because uh, just that my English was really poor at that point. So, so the art definitely helped me more than the others <laughs> to- yeah. Yeah, you felt comfortable there. Yeah. That's so interesting. Well, um, I know you have a slideshow that you wanted to share with everybody. So why don't we look at that and then we can come back to some other questions. And if anyone has a question, please put it in the chat. Yeah. Can ask as we go along or we can take questions at the end, whether they end up being technical or conceptual. Yeah, so 
I have shorter version, longer version, but uh, some of you already know most of the parts what I do, but I'm gonna go a little longer version with uh, a little more description of where I came from and everything with it and uh, hope help you guys to understand where I came from and what I do. Uh, share screen. So let's see. So these days, all these Zoom stuff, so convenient. Yeah, it's pretty crazy how things have changed in such oh, a short time. Yeah, it's like I'm doing visiting artists on Zoom. <laughs> so, I, so this is a kind of really chopped up shorter version of it because because of this pandemic and I've been doing the Zoom lectures and you know artists talk to other schools and organization. Sometimes you know it's 15 minutes, sometimes hour and a half. So I have to create longer and shorter version of it. So this is a kind of chopped up version of it. So hopefully this will help you guys to understand what I do. So I grew up here, this is a Japan. Here's a Russia and China and North and South Korea. Uh, we got a lot going on between there, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> and uh, I grew up this area right there by the Tokyo called Yokohama area. So I grew up in a very historic area with the temples and shrines because they used to have a capital there. So uh, it's surrounded by a mountain and then uh, it's right by the ocean. So when they have a capital there, it's, it's easy not to get attacked by other, other enemies because surrounded by a mountain and outside is ocean. So uh, they had a capital for just a few hundred years. And uh, so it's a, it's a historic traditional town with all these Buddha figures and temples and shrines. And like I said, I was speech pathology a major when I was in Japan and I decided to go to America. I don't even know, you know, if I think about it now, it's a pretty stupid decision to go to America at that point because I had no English at that point. So, but- uh, I would say brave, but go ahead. <laughs> Uh, it just, I didn't really think about it till I get to the airport. And I get to the airports and goodbye to, I mean, you pretty much dump everything. Relationships and families and friends and you dump everything. Like you dump everything you had, goodbye. I'm going to America, you know what I'm saying? So these days, you know, we got Skypes and all that convenient stuff. But back then you buy a piece of phone card and uh, you make an international call. So you go to you know corner store and buy a phone card and 20, 40 bucks or whatever charged. And you 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 go to public phone and uh, you type the number and call international call. So it, it wasn't convenient like Zoom and Skype was existed back then. So you know when I was at the airport, it kind of freaked me out. <laughs> and I get in the airplane and looking at the window like this is always makes me, you know, oh my God, what have I done? And probably I was looking at the window because the person next to me was definitely American or somebody else not speaking in Japanese. So I didn't want to eye contact him and then I start saying, start talking about English or whatever. So I was looking at the window and then outside and I was like, oh my God, what have I done? So every time I go workshop, whatever, still, when I look at the window like this and the airplane, I was like, oh, Kinsuke, you're doing all right. <laughs> you, know, you kind of have to tell yourself this window view is like really like a, kind of stick with me all the time. And so, and then I went to Evergreen State College. The our mascot, Guidak. So Guidak lives in underground for like a 40, 50 years. So our college motto was let it all hang out. <laughs> So those of you who are from a West Coast familiar with the Evergreen, it's a pretty neat school. So Evergreen is is non grading system, no major school. So you take whatever and you get a variation from a professor, like a piece of paper says, I did this, I did that kind of variation, and there's no ABC scale. So you can take like whatever, like you can say, you go Appalachian Mountain. 
and you get credit for it. <laughs> so you just have to find a teacher. So I worked with uh, you know architecture teachers or ceramic teachers and uh, sculpture teachers and just make up a class. Like I make this much stuff and working on glaze and testing glaze. And so I made a piece like this and these are uh, about 24 by 24 or something like that, a regular Scott kiln or something like that. It's the size is about, you know, uh, it fits to the regular uh, electric kiln that you see everywhere. But I tried to make it bigger because if you make big, I realized that I don't have to wait till my piece to get fired. So you know, if you're not on charge of a firing, so you make a little thing and your piece come out from a kiln like a couple weeks later. So I realized that if I make a size of a kiln, then my piece gonna get fired like this. So I, I, at the same time I was practicing how to build. So the skill parts, I was practicing skills, but uh, I, I measured the kiln and made, made the pieces that fits to the kiln. So that was good practice. And also I uh, worked on different stains and slips to try to understand uh, sculptural body as a canvas and use the slips and stain to paint. So you know, I think the great thing about ceramics is you can be sculptor, yes, then you can be painter at the same time, you can be printmaker at the same time. Basically, we're using clay to build the uh, canvas to paint and draw. So, and that's something that my uh, old teacher, Mike Moran or Joel Bat told me that. And, um, and I went to graduate school in the University of Montana. This is about the time I start making figurative work. The reason I went to University of Montana was I just had a no idea where to go. So um, my uh, teacher from undergraduate says, apply University of Montana. And uh, yeah, sure. But also I visited uh, uh, University of Washington because it was uh, closer to where I used to live. And uh, my teacher told me, Ken, Japanese guy teach there. So you should go take your portfolio and go see him. So that was uh, Akio Takamori. So uh, I remember that Akio <laughs> look at my slide says, Ken, you can do this for a weekend and you can get a different job and don't feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, 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 you know, I wasn't shocked because I worked every day and I did my best and then I get that honest opinion. So I wasn't really upset. I was like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so it, since then me and Akio has been, you know, not, I don't want to say a friend, but uh, uh, he's been keeping an eye on me here and then. And sometimes he sends me email or something like that. Hey, can I see your work at the gallery? It looks great. And, uh, so you know he's been he's been he's been not really like a mentor kind of relationship, but uh, he's been very uh, care about me since then. So a few years ago when we lost him, it was just you know I was at the Northern Pottery Northwest at points, and Akio came to my workshop, and, and that 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 was the last time I saw him. But uh, um, of course, then I didn't get into University of Washington, so I get into University of Montana. <laughs> Well, you know, Beth Law, Trey Hill, and uh, and Julia Galloway was there, and that's about the time. So my portfolio was all this, like non-figurative work, and then I went to grad school, and uh, our mascot became Grizzly from uh, uh, Guiduck, so it looks better, uh, and I don't know what their motto is, but I'm sure it's better than that too. So then I start making figurative work because I thought about this, like what makes people to stop, look at things? Like when I was walking on the street, what makes me stop and look at the window? Like, oh, what is that? So before this, I was making a lot of non-figurative work, but then maybe I was like, am I asking too much to audience to stop and look at it? It's like looking at the Zen garden rock. It's, it's a rock. But if I put a face on it and people has an interaction, so I, I was like, maybe I'll make figurative work. So maybe that's gonna help people to stop and look at it. 
So that was kind of reason that why I was making figurative work to start. But uh, again, I started with a non-figurative work, uh, which which is like a giant container shape. It's a closed form. So I was I was I was thinking about containing. So, so when I made figurative work, my idea was still same. Uh, it's a containment was the idea. So that that, but then it's a figurative work that points. And then I made something really big, and probably the eleven feet tall. And uh, you see that it's chopped up of sections because it won't fit to the kiln. Then I realized that you need to have a right facility to make something big like a Jun Kaneko's facility or something. You know, if, you, if your facility is not made for it, you can't really do this because it's just the transporting from studio to kiln is just too much. So, but then I did it. I managed to make a bunch of these. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I tried it because once you make something big like this, the landscape became a part of your art. Um, uh, it leaves just on the coffee table. They, you look up. So if you make something that's taller than you, all of a sudden the surrounding is, surroundings is became part of your work. It's not just your work; it's existing by itself. So you realize that a sculpture needs to have a relation with the surroundings. It can't just exist there. There's some relations, or by locating sculpture in a certain place, it changes the dynamics of it. So, so this experience didn't go well, but uh, you know it was a great experience that at least I tried. And of course, in a graduate school, in a critique, teacher would say, "Kinsuke, this is the ugliest thing you ever made." <laughs> so, I was like, "Yeah, that's right." So, so my uh, thesis exhibition also I made uh, some large piece, but uh, it's greenware. So I went to uh, thesis exhibition uh, three days before opening, and I stopped building. This figure is about eight feet tall-ish. So just go away from a uh, ceiling enough to catch fire. It's a fire hazard if it gets too close to the ceiling. So I got to keep that, this height. But I stopped building her three, four days before opening. And then, uh, again, I want people to look up. But at the same time, I want people to see that leather heart stage to the way clay die. So uh, I think that always that leather heart stage is most beautiful stage that I, I, I always enjoy in my studio space. But at the same time, where they dries out and die, and in a way glaze them and revive them, the fire will revive the clay. It, it's just so fascinating to me. But that's something we don't see in the gallery space very often. So back then, this is like a 2009 or something like that. So I want people to kind of see how clay will go wet to dry. So, so my influence is always coming from very uh, uh, work that's from uh, uh, ancient figures. Some are Japanese, you see South American figures and so on and so. And I always liked that uh, finger touch, like a direct touch feeling to it. Uh, think about when you do coil building or slab building or whatsoever, you feel that connection with a material when you do clay. And I always liked it. Uh, so some of the ancient figure references and you know those figures actually have stories and used for religious reasons or used for just storytelling and you know, i always enjoy that how figure plays uh in our community even this is a japanese folk art and just having those figure we can tell what the community people are doing or even the cartoons will, will, will sort of like teach us like a moral or the rule or what's right or what's wrong or what happens. Or it, it, I like the way people use figure to explain something, I guess. And I like the how people use figure to play with it. Probably some of you play with G.I. Joe and uh, uh, what's this called? Barbie. But yeah, and then you know, I played with a little figurine too, like a robots and stuff. And sometimes it became you, or sometimes became somebody else, and you kind of play with it. So I like that 
the way figure functions to sometimes it became you, sometimes became somebody else, and you you kind of telling stories using it. So, so some of the people that I always like and admire is like Viola Frey, Robert Turner, or Peter Volkus kind of people. And I I, I kind of I never met them, but I, I like their the way they relate with the clay, the material. It's so direct, and I think they understand that material really well. And Maria Martinez, if you guys see like a short video of Martinez, and uh, it, it just really makes sense the way she give an offering and she take clay from a ground and the exchange to it. She give a little offering and do some prayers and. Uh, it's it's definitely like a clay is something you make from zero like a from a ground so and you know once it get fired it stays for hundreds or hundreds of years it just the way maria works is is so precious and beautiful because we buy clay and you know we throw away easy clay dust everywhere and sometime i watch maria's video and i was like I should appreciate material a little better because once I'm building five figures at the same time, it gets really not respecting material very well. And of course, result, results will come out cracking and everything. So to calm myself down to go back to where it came from, the Maria kind of inspires me to respect the material. Uh, and some of a painter, uh, that I always look for is Nathan Orivella and uh, Richard Devencon or uh, Japanese woodblock printer Shiko Munakata, and you know, use of a color and free handed drawings, and it's just so aggressive and so bright and beautiful, I think. And Marino Marini, I don't know if Philadelphia has Marini figure there, but. Uh, it just, uh, if you look at it, it's so simple yet so powerful. So back to the image from an airplane. Uh, I moved a lot when I, when I lived in Philly, I was already lived in Seattle, Montana, and I lived in Philly. And when I'm making a diving figure series, I was at the Fayetteville, Arkansas with Linda and Matthew and uh, the moments of a diving is kind of reminds me that way I flew to the America. So, so that applies to probably the everybody, everybody that watches uh, uh, this Zoom talk today too, because um, we all moved or um, we always like uh, moments of a nervous feeling to jump into a new class, getting a new job, or facing to something new, you know, or facing to something that you're supposed to. That moment is, is reminds me a feeling of standing on a diving board because it makes me very nervous. My heart is going fast, but at the same time, I'm so excited at the same time. So, you know, time I was in an airplane, time I was, time I was on a diving board and the way I move around and kind of thinking about moments of a diving. So I made a lot of figure called Diver, Diver series to express that feeling. And again, just like we talked at the beginning, I was definitely looking for uh, what's common between us than what's different. So, because I didn't speak English, but when I start making art, I made a friends and art became a language. And uh, and I realized that we, we are so common each other, happiness, sadness, angers, and there are a lot of common feeling that we go through. So again, diver figure, uh, I was trying to express that common feeling of the uh, moments of, a, you know, you're standing on a diving board, moments of a moving, moments of facing to new thing. The diving into next steps is always nervous and exciting. So some show at the Cheekwood uh, in Tennessee, I did this exhibit there. I stayed there in the summertime to set up all these shows. I mean, I made a piece there and I had an exhibition at the end. And some shows at Kentucky. Again, you know, this, I like the figure where they're picking nose, but um, I don't know why they went. Oh, they that piece always come back when I send it to exhibit, always come back. Maybe 
funny is not quite accepted in the art field yet, maybe. I don't know. But, you know, there's always the optimist that uh, always easy to dive into new things. There's a people always uh, uh, nervous, like extra nervous to get into new thing. And I guess the picking nose is an optimist one. I'm ready. <laughs> so then I also, I use a lot of bird image because migration bird and uh, you know Peter Morgan's know know about the bird a lot, so I, I went to see the bird a couple of times with him, and uh, you know I, I like the way the bird uh, travel from north to south, south to north, and uh, it kind of reminds me myself to move location to location, place to place. So, but the rubber duckies are they're so iconic in terms of um i don't know is it safety is it something familiar is it to me a rubber ducky is more like um well i mean it's obviously playful but i know something safe about them to me yeah yeah that too yeah and uh duck duck troubles <laughs> <laughs> So then I had a chance to do glass with this guy in 2000, probably eight or so. And that was the first time I exposed to glass. And, uh, and I was Dale Chihuly in case anyone else didn't see that he, the picture's kind of small. Match? Yeah, if you, it's like a Mickey Mouse, man. Everybody know who that is. Um, probably somebody's inside of it. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Chris, Chris Taylor is working there right now. Chris Taylor. Mm -hmm used to be a uh, uh, work at the clay studio there, it was a uh, uh, director or president or whatever at the uh, pill check right now. So yep. he see Del Chihuly a lot, I think. Yep. But then I moved to Kentucky uh, after Fayetteville and I finally get to do more glass work with this guy, Stephen Powell. And uh, Stephen Powell is, you know, very known glass artist and uh you know he's he's you know lino come to our studio and you know, lino team work and you know he he's an amazing guy and uh and steve always like uh, kinsuke let's do some collaboration and then uh it was a little town in uh, kentucky and once i you know i go out and then drink beers and stuff and after work and you know nobody talked to me at that point because it's a little town with a free restaurant like everybody's like who's this new guy right but then once uh, once uh, steve said i'm gonna do collaboration with a uh, steve and he went on the news and stuff and uh and then uh and then the local people start buying me beer you're the one yeah. in collaboration with a uh, steve right it's like a little town thing, you know. Now I'm I'm like in a team, <laughs> like I'm accepted in the group, in a little town. That's funny. Steve, Steve, and me work together. So I'm acting like I want to involve to the process, even I don't really know. So, but uh, uh, this is obviously I don't know what am I doing. You know, Steve's <laughs> hands are burning, but he never yelled at me. We made a lot of peace together, and you know, it's just great time. So he has again look like I know what am I doing. Well, you look very serious, like you know, yeah, like you know what you're doing. It's like uh, you know, two thousand degree right there on the hands. Glass is a so exciting thing, but look how safety we are, like a shorts and shirt. <laughs> but for me and Steve did a lot of peace in the summertime. It was like, you know, glass has like a teamwork and glass has like speed because once it started, it started, like it's gonna go all the way to the end because it's glass. Once you pull the glass out of kiln, you just gotta go, 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 go. So it was intense hour and a half or so to make a one piece. So, so you know, of course, the local people come see it and become big entertainment. Like, uh, you know, just a bunch of these glass glass places uh, is, is always a lot of people to watch because it's so entertaining for sure. Because and glass and ceramics is similar because it's kind of same material and uh, uh, around 2,000, 2,100 degrees, so. Yeah, but you're not near the clay when it's that hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very it's, Yeah. There's a lot of preparation. I mean, I, I watched the video of this happening and you made the, you made a piece and then did a cast 
Um, so you had a mold, is that right? That's what's happening there. Well, I had a mold and uh, you see the mold underneath there. I had a mold and the steep blow glass into it. Yeah, yeah, it's preparation for like an hour and a half and it might not work. Right, and you had to work for like a couple of weeks to get ready. The mold is about 250 pounds because it's really thick and has a chicken wire mesh inside. It's really thick uh, slab of a, a, a plaster. Uh, it was really heavy and sometimes works out, sometimes don't, but uh, it's all one shot mold. So what can I do? So, but uh, Steve is always, you know, help me out, try to figure out, figure out how to do glass piece. And uh, unfortunately he passed away a few years ago, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a Paul Nelson from another glass artist in Kentucky. So Paul helped me again to cast glass and uh, so I made a mold like this for Paul and uh, how you get the piece out is like, you just have to break the mold. So if you make this 150, 200 pound of mold and you break them at the end and uh, even piece comes out okay or not. But by doing this, you get nice finger touch texture on the surface of a glass. And uh, uh, it's really, I was so happy about it. Uh, I have a yellow ceramic head inside. That's why he said it's yellow. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. But, how, big, uh, how big is it? It was about 21 inches or so, I think. Yeah. So, so this is uh, something that I do right now with a solid casting in the ceramic kiln. Uh, so, because uh, I don't have a Steve around anymore, so I just cast glass and, and plaster, but I, I heat it up to uh, 1500 degree to uh, melt the glass in the mold. And then, uh, uh, so it's very solid and heavy. It's not exciting up with uh, blowing glass with a glass blower. So, but eventually, you know, I want to find a local glass blower to do some blowing glass again eventually. but. Uh, is it, the loss of a Steve was kind of hurt me a lot. So <laughs> it just, uh, it, it's not going to be fun as what it is, you know, with, with yeah. a Steve. So, uh, so, so then uh, lately, this is like a Red Lodge clay has a piece like this right now. So I do a lot of shiny piece right now. I guess the uh, glass influence are definitely it too, to use more color. Oh, yeah. and that I need to move on from old work. So try not to be an old news and try to do something new. Are these since, are these this year or from before this year? I, Red Lodge still has it. Red Lodge Clay Center still have those. I just mean, I mean, I was thinking about the question of how the pandemic has sort of affected Does how you're looking at your work. And I was thinking maybe you're trying to be, it's shiny, it's cheerful, trying to cheer people up. Yeah, definitely, because this was a uh, you know small version. This is like a four by four, or something really small, but you know this is like uh, big. So uh, this was a project I did during the pandemic, and for maker, pandemic wasn't quite the punishment. You know, we we just gonna go studio anyway, so it wasn't quite. Uh, I just had a nice quiet studio time last. I mean this year, so. It wasn't all negative to me, but uh, these pieces I made during the pandemic was more colorful than uh, others and exhibited this way right now at the local museum uh, with a photographer. And I definitely used the more color this year and uh, maybe, maybe pandemic is a part of it, but um, I think the positive side of uh, this year is is we appreciate the community, we appreciate individuals, and uh, I see a lot of good thing because it's not just a pandemic happened this year. There were a lot more things happened this year, and, uh, yes. and uh, so during the time that I see that bright side of our in, in individuals and kind and helping each other's and if there's a people lost a job or family or people got sick and ill or and I think that 
I see that bright hope to our community after what happened this year, because in that worst situation of what the country is, uh, I think people still try to help each other in a little community. And so this summer, pretty much whole towns are empty and restaurants not running and everything, and you don't see your friends and so. And I start seeing my friends outside, but never hang out inside yet. So we just sit at the parking lot and, you know, so it's not like we go inside and you know, just too risky, because especially I'm teaching at the university. So, um, but then I appreciate the moments of the community and people together, especially this year, because there's a lot of good thing people did. So I guess that made me add more color to my work this year, I think. So other project I'm working on this winter break right now till January, mid January is, this is a new uh, museum at the Hendricks University. Uh, they have a new museum that funded by a Wingate Foundation. So I see, you see the yellow lines there. I supposed to have like a troll figures. So I've been making individual figures for that uh, display at the new museum right now. And again, I, I think I'm using more color to it. Yeah. And and they also have a much more direct relation to cartoons and you used cartoons as one of your kind of um, inspiration images yeah. earlier. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So something like that. So yeah, I made it more cuter, I think. Yeah. And and you and you do sort of see that as somewhat related. And how about the the second to last thing you showed us with the group of heads? There's also this was happening in the glass. There were spots of color that aren't really related to the to face shape. They're just like them. Some look like bullseyes. Uh, I um, in the past with a more brown looking color work that I used to do too, but. Uh, uh, it's again, it's a canvas to paint. So at the points when I'm painting, I don't really worry about uh, face itself, which is front or back. Mm. I just go with the shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, the color can create a speed, color can create, and pattern can create uh, rhythm and speed, and uh, color can change the uh, temperature too. So uh, yeah, not really concerning about it needs to be a face or something like that, yeah. Because you see the face underneath from the text, from the form, and so you're really just giving people kind of another it's kind of, of communication. It's our nature to kind of find a face in nature, you know, like you go hike in the woods and you find a face somewhere. It's sort yeah. of like nature to reflect to something looks like a face, I think. And that is related to what you were saying too about what would people look at? What do you look at when you walk down the street? And we're, I think we're just fascinated by faces because it's like looking in a mirror, mm -hmm. like looking at ourselves. And if you're looking at a sculpture, you can stare at it as long as you want and study the way the nose connects to the cheek and no one's gonna bother you because it's a sculpture. And it's, I do think that there's a, a human, basic human need to kind of look at a face. Right, yeah. And does that have something to do with them being childlike as well, do you think? Well, childlike figure is, you know, I always stick with that because I guess I, you know, grew up with a big headed cartoon, watching big headed cartoon all the time, child, but at the same time, uh, children, something that are you, we all go through as a child, or you have a kids right now, or something that I, try to find a way to relate it to everybody. So we were children in a way sometime and we we maybe are children in a still or we have a children. So childlike figure seem like a, a good way to engage with the in people. That, yeah. yeah, in that universal again. I need to set certain platforms that everybody can share. So, of course, the figurative work and childlike figure. So, something to start with. I think the foundation uh, as that childlike figure. I'm using that as a foundation of the uh, narrative, I think. Yeah. 
and then the um <laughs> something everyone can relate to like picking your nose uh -huh. is good um i like the funny part there's in that same series a lot of the divers were um they had their hands up so you know you talk about them being about to jump in but it's it's actually that they're sort of can you talk about that particular moment? Because that's not really like this moment. That's something else, I think. What, what do you think? What do I think? I think that they're, um, I think it's the moment of um, you, the exhilaration from the adrenaline. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, to be honest, how many people in here? Like 42 people. Here's a secret. I just put an arm up because there's an inner tube around, inner tube around it, uh -huh. right? So if I try to put arm down, inner tube gets away. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put an arm up. But it works and it works because yeah, there's another thing there. It's like you will say, that looks like this. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, that's it. A good art historian making stuff up about my sculptures. Right. Yes, I meant to that. Well, but it is, it's whatever someone looks at. I mean, the point is no. you want someone to have a personal experience and have their own yeah. idea, right? So it's just, I, you know, as a maker, I, my undergraduate teacher taught me this way too, but uh, be honest with where you are, how you are, because it's easier to, you know, if you start making something that's not you, it's really hard, sometimes make you ill. But by some points that we have to make work to make a living or whatsoever, so you have to search for for what people are interested in. Of course, I mean, you know, if you are saying starving artist and, and you need to do some research and see what sells now. If you make certain work, if you want to make a money, there's a way to do it. But uh, I can't give up certain. You know, I can't give up entire my soul to the sales, right? So, so there's always the balance of. And in the realistic world, I have to pay a bill. If I ship my work, it costs me seven hundred bucks. So somebody has to pay for that. So, uh, realistically, I have to do some marketing and research and colors and what people likes to buy and so right. But I can't sell my soul all the way down because. I think the, you need to make the work that belongs to you, like who you are. And, and I guess that my fingers and toes and, you know, sometime uh, somebody write about my fingers and toes on the figures is something I never thought about. And I was like, oh, that's a beautiful. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. It, uh, it just that a lot of parts as a maker, be honest, you don't quite think about every single things like that. Sometimes it just happens because just where you touch things and the way you curve, where you see things. And uh, so it, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean it's not true if you didn't consciously think about it. Mm. Because it, again, like your, your work is about that universal communication and universal emotions that can't, you know, we were talking earlier about how it's hard to express it verbally. And the, that's the point of being a visual artist is that you're saying something that you can't quite put your finger on just using a lot of words. You have to show the image. So well, I'm glad I come up because it became an MC posters. Looks very happy, you know, like that piece is like a 2014, but you know, still, still gets used. So I, I'm very happy about, about the results came out. So sometimes I guess that I didn't expect all the way to what's going to happen, but uh, yeah. sometimes just going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. And it resonates with people because they want joy. They want hope and excitement and we're attracted to that. That's yeah. what people are going to stop and look at through the window when, when they walk down the street. Um, we don't have too much time left, so I just want to ask people to, um, if anyone does have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, you can also unmute yourself because we're actually five minutes from the end, but I wanted to make sure I noted that um, Kinsuki is going to be the guest juror for small favors. So if anyone out there is thinking of applying, please do. The application is available and maybe Shannon could put that link in the chat also. <clears throat> do you want to... Um, say anything maybe about your time specifically at the clay studio um i was a year and a half maybe so but it's it's 
I, I remember Peter's there, but I remember I woke up in the middle of the night and the Peter, I gotta make something good. Like that's that was always in my conscious. Like Peter was uh, downstairs eating dinner or something. I was, I was already sleeping, but then I woke up and went downstairs and Peter, dude, I gotta make something good. And I don't even know what that is still. <laughs> But you know, like always, oh, my consciousness just like make, 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 make. Like, oh. so I gotta make something good. You know, it just Clay Studio definitely. I mean, I was from Montana, so it was hard to live in a big city. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a make, make, make time. And there's a great. I didn't know there's so many artists in the Philly, and uh, it made my brain super busy in a way too. <laughs> it's, yeah. In a good way, though, in a good way, in a very influential place to be as an artist, I think. Yeah, it's good to be surrounded by that, but may, it's not always some the way someone wants to live forever. I mean, I love it here, but some people just kind of need it for a bit, and then they like kind of take take yourself to a quieter place. And and I, you are welcome to say something bad about your time at the Clay Studio too. I'm, I mean, I think we're all interested in the whole experience. Oh, as uh, the people do this kind of things, it's a great to move around because you see many different ways to do things. Even we are all doing clay, everybody do different things. And it's great uh, if you're young and young and students and, and try to build a career like this, move to a different place. And, you know, it's just see different things, meet different people. It's gonna be a good for good for for the future definitely. So, uh, moving to Philly was big big thing for me and challenging at the same time. It benefited me a lot. So uh, that's why I get to talk to people in the East Coast now. So it's it's, it's definitely a thing. The Clay Studio exists there, so it's good. If it's New York, I can't afford it. But Philadelphia is just as good as New York. But if, if it's if it's North Philly, I can afford it. Well, I mean, then that's why it's a good place to be because we, I feel like we have a supportive community and it's, you can actually live here, which is pretty important, um, pretty important for allowing people to um, express themselves, just to be able to know that you can afford a place mm -hmm. to live. So, well, we are, oh, and there's one question, there's something in the chat. Oh, it is Ken Ming. How has been working as an immigrant artist in the U.S.? Have you thought of going back to Japan? Do you think you would have the same career path? Thanks for the question. Well, big one. When I was young, moved to America, I totally left Japan. Like I never thought about it at all. Like I dumped it. Like Japan, I'm not. If I like Japan, I should just go back to Japan. So I just dumped it. Just, so I never thought about you know myself as a Japanese American artist or like uh, you know I tried to cut that ratio by being Japanese and just be American you know, as redneck as possible in Montana you know like but you know it, it just it just uh, you know I didn't you know unless if I'm in a picture or or looking at the win window at the street or something and you know, oh, I realize that how Asian I am but till then I don't really think about it and you know Peter is there too but Peter never treat me like uh like that too Peter just treat me as a friend so I had a great friends that uh, treat me like a human not just uh, you're, you're from Japan all the time but uh I'm getting old now and then uh, now I'm making little cartoony stuff and I try to accept the way I came from right now more and more so I do try to see more Japanese cartoons, try to see Japanese, what I grew up with more and more these days. But back then in the 20s, I was just totally rejected where I came from. So am I gonna have the same pass if I go back to Japan? No, 100% no. Uh, uh, Japanese ceramic world probably have a different system and I don't know, I'll be welcomed or not. <laughs> so I don't know, but uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I sometimes visit there and, but also I have a health condition, so eventually I'm gonna have to go back. I did a I did a kidney transplant, so um, if uh, if American insurance is bad as what it is, then probably I have to go back to Japan to 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 get treated if I, if I lose my kidney again. But uh, you know, right now I have a transplanted kidney and everything is going well. So as long as it goes well, I'm gonna be stay here. But uh, yeah, so I don't quite have any plan to going back right now. Well, thanks for answering. I mean, as a Korean American, <laughs> I never thought about going back or 
never like counted me as fully Korean, yeah. but this year has been very hard. And because, you know, we look different. And then because of the flu, I mean, not flu, COVID came from, you know, Asia. This was the first time ever that I felt like, oh, I have a different skin. Yeah, so, I remember that Arkansas governor or senator sent a letter says a China virus. And I was like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> It just by saying government saying that uh, Asian specific like that and they don't know what, what how we feel about it you know they don't know how we might get treated by locals and uh, but so far I never get punched or anything but uh, yeah, it, it definitely made me uncomfortable when government says it's the China virus it doesn't matter you're Chinese or not if you look like Asian you get trouble you know so some of the local Asian restaurant people said hey Ken are you okay like I get harassed at the Walmart and then oh, okay you gotta be careful it's just you know it's just very un an unfortunate thing happened definitely again thank you yeah, thanks again, Ken Ming, for your question and for sharing that with us. Just it's such an important thing to talk about. And hopefully if there's a way that we can all offer support, we're all ready to do that. I just, it's horrible to hear um, on top of all the other hard stuff that's happening this year. Um, we should be coming together. So hopefully we can build on that. Um, I, it's an interesting question too, and I'm actually, I'm really glad to hear you talk about that idea that you were rejecting the Japanese cu culture um, and that now you're kind of coming to a point where you're interested in like looking back and thinking about how it affected you and what that means. And um, the nostalgia is an important part of what makes us who we are. Um, nostalgia, yeah, see, I'm gonna use that word. <laughs> Well, and you and I are almost the same age. I'm a little, I'm a little older than you, so. But uh, we, I have that. It's a point in life, I think, that where we are. It's a point of our life, like we talked about this yesterday. You know? Yeah, feeling, feeling that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we've we've spent another lovely hour with our community, um, talking and just really connecting, and the fact that your art is about communication. And we had a chance to talk to you today about it and and hear your thoughts and just spend some time looking at other people's faces. Speaking of enjoying looking at faces, that is a big part of why this hour for me is important because I can see all your smiles and your your eyes and everyone nodding when they hear something that they agree with and, and connect with. So thanks again to everyone who joins us. Oh, hi, Adam. He's hiding behind his pot there for a second. Oh, he went away. Um, Hansuki, thank you for taking the time to do this. Thank you for agreeing to be the juror for small favors. And I'm looking forward to talking to you again soon. Everybody else have a great week. Oh, I guess I need to tell you next week and the week after that, we will not have the lunch and learn because it is holiday time. So I hope that you'll all enjoy that. You can always go back and watch an old one on our website. We have them all recorded there. Um, and if you really miss me, send me an email and I'm happy to say hi. <laughs> have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.